All right, so welcome back um, to the second half of this lecture where we're going to talk about mechanisms for achieving attitude control, so specifically actuators, so things that are used to control attitude. Uh, so uh, before we get started, I'll just, uh, we're going to sort of start, go from more control to less control, or less control to more control. Uh, so in the interest of sort of motivating the problem and starting with no control, um, well, attitude control is, is sort of a hidden uh, component of most of these uh, satellites, uh, but it's a necessary one. And so uh, what happens, well, what, what happens if you don't have one? Well, you're in space, right? There's no atmosphere to, to control tumbling, right? This a aircraft are sort of designed so that they're naturally aerodynamically stable. They, they, they tend to, uh, well, with, with certain exceptions, they tend to, uh, to naturally orient, uh, naturally orient, right? They've got this wedge. And so if they pitch up, right, there's uh, they, they, they try and uh, have some stabilizer, some horizontal stabilizer, which causes you to pitch back down. And so the, most aircraft are naturally uh, aerodynamically stable. Uh, again, with some, you know, the F-22 and stuff like that, uh, fighter jets uh, like to move more quickly, and so they're not aerodynamically stable. But in any case, in space, right, we don't have that advantage. And so uh, if, we don't, uh, if we're not controlling continuously our, our attitude, and now we don't have aerodynamic sur surfaces to control our, 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 our attitude, um, then we, we start tumbling, and once you get in a tumble, all sorts of bad things happen, right? Avoid tumbling. Well, first of all, what happens when you, you're tumbling? Well, you tend to be moving fast, and so you lose, uh, lose attitude, orient, lose orientation. Uh, and you also lose communication. So that fixed uh, communication link to the, to the, to the ground station uh, is lost, right? Because you're pointing arbitrary direction. Um, and so you can't give it communications to, uh, to, to, to reorient, right? And so this all has to be done automatically on board the spacecraft. And so if you like look up in the, the sky, uh, it's relatively easy to occasionally see uh, a tumbling spacecraft, and you you know they're tumbling because uh, they have this like uh, they 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 flicker right because the different surfaces reflective surfaces come into and out of uh, out of orientation, so they're they're reflecting sun back at you sometimes and not at other times, and so when they're they're randomly tumbling, you get these like uh, these flash flashing uh, objects in the sky. And so this is an example of a tumbling spacecraft, which is occasionally flashing you because it's, uh, it, it, its reflective surfaces are changing orientation all the time. So uh, if, once that happens, the spacecraft is, is, is essentially dead, and, and you have to start all over again with a new spacecraft, which is rather expensive. Right. <clears throat> so we would, uh, we would generally like to avoid this situation. And so uh, the question is, uh, what can we do? What can we do about it? So again, active attitude control is essentially required for almost all spacecraft applications and certainly most modern spacecraft applications. So our ACDSs, or attitude dynamics and control systems, have gotten very sophisticated nowadays, right? Much more so even than when I started teaching this course, which is maybe 12 years ago or something like that. Uh, so now, um, Um, and we'll talk, I'll, I'll give some examples of that uh, later on. Uh, so communication, obviously, uh, line of sight uh, with, the, with the ground station or with the Tedris. Uh, reconnaissance, right? You want to, you want to point at, pho take photographs, do a SIGINT, something like that, collect EM signals, right? Pointing accuracy is very important. Navigation, you'd like to, to delta V in the right direction, 
so presumably in the direction you'd like to go versus like right back at the at the earth where you, and then you'd re-enter or something like that. Um, there are exceptions, but they're very rare. And we'll, we'll start the, the lecture by talking about a couple of the exceptions. Even the very first spacecraft was spin, spun stabilized. It was stabilized attitude. It didn't work very well, but it was, was in fact stabilized. Um, even though all it was doing was sending off a ping. Right? Uh, the, de the, the problem is, of course, unlike aircraft, we don't have aerodynamic forces to provide stability. We can't use, uh, you know, most, most wing shapes, right? They have uh, flaps or they have flaps which can bend down, provide torque in one direction or another, right? We don't have that, right? So we have to find new and creative ways to provide these torques. So our essential goal in this sub-lecture is to create torque. And how do we do that in space without aerodynamic surfaces? Torque. Torque is the name of the game. Oops. Not create. Well, OK. So our options are relatively limited because we're in space, right? There's no aerodynamic surfaces. Um, and so, well, what can we use? Well, the most obvious example, uh, obvious case is, is thrusters, right? We can use thrusters to create torque. We'll talk about that to some extent. Right? If you pair your thrusters off the uh, axis, like put a thruster there and put a thruster there, right? You put some thrust, uh, some some force in the direct direction, force in that direction. Uh, your center of mass is here, right? You have a moment arm, force times a moment arm yields torque. So thrusters, however, are expensive. Well, it, not expensive is in, doesn't cost that much to create a thruster, but the delta V budget uh, for attitude control using thrusters is relatively high, adds weight to your spacecraft. Um, so these are generally bad uh we don't use them for continuous orbit maintenance uh, because of the delta v requirements and uh they're not particularly accurate also you see only 0.1 to 0.5 degrees accuracy uh from uh, for, for for thrusters the other options are momentum exchange devices and these two are really grouped together, although they operate very differently. We'll talk about them actually in reverse order. We'll talk about reaction wheels, and then we'll talk about CMGs. Uh, spin stabilization, which is an important case. It's used less for less nowadays for, uh, for, um, uh, for on-orbit stabilization. Um, so less nowadays for on orbit. But there's still, pro still very commonly used, spin stabilization is very commonly used uh, before you sort of um, activate your spacecraft. And that's because there's a communications gap. You're not sending signals, you're not communicating with the satellite before it gets oriented. So they're very commonly, you put them on a rocket and uh, right before you release, you spin them up a bit. Right? We'll talk about spin stabilization later. Uh, a very cheap, in terms of delta V or energy requirements, these require energy, by the way. Electricity, that is. A very cheap um, way to, uh, to do attitude stabilization is gravity gradient stabilization. And we'll go through that, but it's not very accurate, right? You see, only five degrees of accuracy. And finally, uh, we have magnetic torquers, right? When you're near the Earth, low Earth orbit primarily. Uh, you can use the Earth's magnetic field to create torque, right? Using it the same way a compass does, right? So we'll go through a selection of, well, actually, we'll go through all of these. 
and sort of talk about the basics of how they work and the limitations and the, and the pluses and minuses and so forth. Right. Um, before we do, however, uh, I want to give some mention to the D part of ADCS. Right. D. Attitude determination. Because ADCS, uh, obviously, the control, right, uh, is the actuator, right? But you need to know which direction to create a torque in order to orient your satellite. And in order to figure that out, you need to determine which orientation you are in. And that's the determination part. Now, again, we're not going to talk about it, but it's absolutely necessary. Right. Um, and so I'm just on one slide. I'll go through the basics of attitude determination. But again, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on it. Um, so aircraft, right, have some, uh, you know, they use, typically use gyros and they have GPS and there's like, there's lots of options uh, for, for, for terrestrial orientation, um, but less, fewer options in space. So let's go through a few of these. Um, I'm going to focus on the, uh, these attitude sensors. Uh, another option which is less used in space are the rate sensors. So this is primarily in the, the aero people, right? The airplane people, they want to know how fast your, your, your aircraft is, is rotating and things like that. Uh, it's less critical in space. So this is primarily aero people are interested in gyroscopes and IMUs and uh, inertial navigation systems, which combine IMUs with other things. Uh, and then in added to in space, we will we'll focus on these things, right? But I'll make a couple of mentions, right? A gyroscope, right, uh, for rate sensing. Uh, so basically, you've got like something which is spinning, right? It's a gyroscope spinning about its axis. Uh, and then if your airplane or whatever happens to be rotates around that gyroscope, the gyroscope will maintain its orientation. So by measuring the angle of the body with the gyroscope, you can sort of get attitude off of that. It's better, I mean, because these things slowly drift over time, uh, it's more commonly used to detect uh, the rate of change of that angle than the actual angle itself. Uh, likewise, IMU is very cheap. Your cell phone your, has one, no doubt. Uh, the IMUs so uh, can be printed on a circuit board. Well, not printed, but they basically have a small mass uh, here. Small mass. I don't know why it's doing that for me. Uh, and then when your uh, the thing it's attached to moves, right? There's a reaction force. So motion of the board, and then there's a reaction force in the opposite direction, uh, which essentially reaction force uh, is created by acceleration of the mass when the circuit board moves. Right. So your your cell phone has one. It generates. It can very accurately measure acceleration. Right. So this measures acceleration. but it doesn't measure absolute position. So if you integrate the acceleration over time, you can get an estimate for your position, but it's not that accurate, right? That's why it's, it's a rate sensor. Uh, in inertial navigation systems tend to try and combine these rate sensors with, uh, with, with other inf inf data in order to figure out your absolute position. <clears throat> right. So what are the options for, uh, for spacecraft, right? Uh, so the, there is an equivalent to the, uh, the, the gyroscope, which is a gyro compass, which basically is what I described here. Right? Uh, so I won't dwell on that uh, for a great deal of time. It's just it's in a ball, basically, and there's very little friction. And so uh, as the spacecraft moves around, right, you can measure this, this, this angle change. 
Uh, unfortunately, gyro compasses tend to drift a little bit, and so it's not very reliable over long periods of time. Um, the gold standard uh, in spacecraft navigation is the Star Tracker, and I'll sort of focus on that. Uh, they're very common nowadays. Uh, so basically, with the, uh, with the Star Tracker, you have uh, your spacecraft. It has a camera. which is oriented into space, not, on the, not towards the Earth, into space. And it sees the stars here. And fortunately, the, uh, the stars are pretty much fixed in space. And essentially, it looks for the constellations, like the same way people have been navigating for hundreds of years. You look for the constellations in the sky, and based on the time of day and, and so forth, uh, you can figure out uh, what your... your which, which constellation you're looking at. Uh, so let's make Leo, or the, uh, the hunter, right, Orion. And, I don't know, there. And so uh, we know that uh, the, uh, the star in Orion's belt is, uh, is pointing in one particular direction. And so by measuring where that is in your CCD, your, it takes a picture of this. Uh, it knows how the camera is mounted onto the spacecraft, and so it can figure out which direction it's pointing, and therefore which direction the uh, the spacecraft is oriented in. So that's the uh, the star tracker. Star tracker. Um, so again, right? Uh, this is the this is the best, right? It's very accurate. And uh, uh, very reliable and very well established. This is an image of a star tracker, by the way, this, this right here. So basically, this is your CCD. Oops, can't see that, CCD, right? And it uh, figures out uh, what you're looking at. It identifies the stars in the field of view. And right, it can basically do that for any field of view, right? It just like sees what stars are there. Matt uh, coordinates it to the known uh, positions of the stars and figures out which direction you're pointing. It doesn't even need a very big field of view. Um, disadvantages, of course, it has to be looking towards space. Right. So typically, we'll mount them on the side of your spacecraft so that you're, you're always looking into space. Of course, if your spacecraft starts tumbling, uh, you're going to have a problem because it's gonna, the Earth's going to come into the field of view, and you'll lose your stars, and you won't be able to track them fast enough, and so all nasty things. So don't tumble your spacecraft. Right. But if, you do, if you're not, not, not tumbling, star trackers are pretty good. Uh, there's some other options, right, in space. Uh, so here's your, your Earth, here's your satellite. Uh, another uh, very cheap, uh, relatively cheap and uh, reliable way of orienting in space is uh, to look at the Earth, so Earth tracking spacecraft. So basically, you can, if you look at the Earth, and this is especially good in low Earth orbit, so this is the Earth tracker, right? Uh, essentially, what you, in fact, you can do this in infrared, right? Infrared, it's very easy to distinguish the Earth from space, even at nighttime, uh, because the Earth is warm and space is cold, right? And so you can figure out where the, uh, the, the horizon of the Earth is. It forms a circle there, and that by pinpointing the, the center of that, you can sort of, if you know where the Earth is at a given moment in time, you can sort of figure out uh, what your orientation with respect to the Earth is, right? Assuming you know your position. That in, for position, you can get GPS. The GPS works in space, by the way. So Earth trackers, right? 
um, very cheap and uh, inexpensive, sometimes combined with uh, sun sensors, right? So you can always see the Earth. Uh, slight disadvantage with sun sensors uh, is that you can't always see the sun. Right? But if you can, right, then you can do the same thing with the sun, right? Again, the sun has very uh, good IR profile, hot IR trackers are, IR sensors are reliable, uh, very easy to use, and uh, can easily differentiate the, uh, the, uh, the sun from, from space. Right? So you can use a sun sensor also to, uh, to get it a, a, a position vector or orientation vector and, uh, and use that to, to figure out your orientation. Uh, so that's the sun sensor. Got to the earth tracker. Uh, the Earth Tracker, right, is, uh, the, so I talked really about the Earth IR Horizon sensor. Uh, you can get more sophisticated with the Earth Trackers. Uh, so, um, but if you're really getting that sophisticated, you would generally go to a Star Tracker. So most, most Earth sensors are actually Horizon sensors. And finally, uh, you can get some orientation by using a compass, the old-fashioned way. Uh, you uh, sense the magnetic field lines of the Earth. So the magnetic field lines go like this. Draw a magnetic field line. Right. So if you measure the direction of the magnetic field line, right, that gives you some uh, information on orientation of the spacecraft body with respect to that field line. It's not perfect information because, right, uh, you can be rotating about that field line and you can't tell the difference, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, that gives you some information as well. So often we combine various sensors. If we don't have a star tracker, which is of course the best, uh, we can uh, use uh, earth trackers combined with magnetometers, uh, or combined with sun sensors to, uh, to get our attitude. Right. So that's the attitude determination part of the problem. Again, we're not gonna dwell on it too much um, if you want an attitude control system, they're pretty standard nowadays, relatively uh, uh, inexpensive. So for example, this is uh, who is CubeSat pointing, or it's like a specialized company for producing these things, right? So here's a, you can buy their star tracker. Uh, we'll talk about reaction wheels in a second. You can buy an off the shelf reaction wheel uh, and so forth. Uh, if we go back to our slide, Go to another one. So there's the uh, Star Tracker. Uh, the Star Trackers are, of course, the gold standard, so they're more common than other trackers. Let's see if they've got uh, uh, what they've got here. Um, cameras and payloads. Um, added, attitude sensors, here we go. All right. So what have we got here under the attitude sensors? Um, so we've got some IR sensors for uh, horizon sensing. Uh, we got a star tracker for 30,000 euros. Uh, sun sensor, there's your sun sensor. Um, sun sensor again, earth sensor, right? All of these things. Sun sensor, sun sensor, sun sensor, right? So a relatively low cost, you see the uh, sun sensor is only 3,300 euros there. Um, whereas the star tracker is more expensive, it's 30,000 euros. So again, uh, the Sun Tracker, Earth Tracker, IR, Horizon sensors, uh, generally cheaper than the Star Trackers, but Star Trackers are much preferred because they're more accurate, uh, somewhat more reliable. So that's uh, all I'm going to say about attitude uh, determination. Uh, I'll focus in the rest on the control aspects. And so I guess if you're designing your mission, right, one option is... Uh, is, uh, is to opt out, right? Uh, no control whatsoever, right? You can opt out. And of course, this depends on your mission define. On what's your mission? In very few cases, there are missions that don't require active attitude control systems, right? Mission design and spacecraft design. Um, so the most well-known example, well, one you've already seen, which is Lagios, right? Remember Lagios? That was the disco ball, right? Where 
Uh, basically, it's uh, it's a bunch of mirrors, and you're on the uh, on the Earth, and you shine a laser at the at the disco ball, and it shines it directly back at you, right? So no orient, no specific orientation of this. Uh, as long as you hit one of those little disco ball lights, uh, no orientation uh, of the spacecraft is required. It could be spinning even, if you like. Uh, the second uh, example that I can think of is the, uh, is the echo communication satellites. Uh, so these are relatively old satellites. Uh, you can see here, right? Uh, you can date the, the picture from that. Is that like 50s? Hmm. 60s? Let's call it 60s. Uh, based on that on that car right there, uh, so the, uh, the the echo satellites were basically big balloons, uh, reflective balloons, and so the idea behind the echo satellites is uh, you put one of these balloons in space, and uh, you uh, very big balloons. You can see how it's like uh, it's not quite as big as the uh, as the uh, the hundred meter uh, uh, advanced Orion satellites, but uh, they're, they're relatively big. And the idea is you're here in Europe, you're here in the U.S., and you bounce communication signals off these satellites, and they bounce back onto uh, to, to, to your target, right? And so this gets around the fact that, like, uh, communication signals will tend to like, just go off into space, and this sort of creates, like, uh, you, know, you know, like, what, what's uh, the uh, amateur ham radio operators, right? There's some ionosphere which bends... Uh, signal uh, radio sig so certain radio signals back onto the Earth, but most EM signals will just go off into space. And so the idea is, you if you use, have the Echo Star, it'll bounce those back in the same way that ham radio uh, signals will bounce back onto in, in, onto the Earth. Right. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, by the way, is in, inflated in a big blimp hanger. I think this is NASA Ames. There's a big blimp hanger in NASA Ames near Stanford, actually. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I, I don't think the actual spacecraft had NASA written on it because that would not be a good idea. Uh, so this is probably just a prototype. Um, anyway, so in this case, obviously, uh, there's spherical symmetry. That's the key. And if there's spherical symmetry, it doesn't matter if the, if the spacecraft is tumbling or not because all orientations are equally advantageous. <laughs> this one got its own post-it stamp, right? So bouncing, I guess this is Europe, and this is US, right? and they're bouncing back and forth signals. <clears throat> right, so uh, next to no design for your attitude control system uh, is, uh, is thrusters, thruster control systems. Um, so, Thruster control systems are not great, um, but uh, but they are used, right? They uh, they can be used for momentum dumping, for example, um, but uh, not very accurate. And of course, they use fuel, not accurate, and they use fuel. Right, but uh, they are fast. And um, they don't uh, they they don't have some of the disadvantages that we'll talk about with the other attitude control systems. And so the mathematics here is not terribly complicated, right? Your uh, thrusters produce a force. Uh, the distance from the center of mass. of the thruster, right? So here's the center of mass. There's the delta x. Distance, that's the moment arm. Right, that distance produces a torque. Right? Now, uh, these are usually combined uh, in pairs so that the net force on the, uh, the net thrust produced by these pairs of thrusters uh, is, is zero. And so that's you don't that mean that's that's so you don't change your orbit. All you want is to change your orientation. 
Uh, again, they're typically bang, bang. You turn them off and you turn them off. Uh, relatively straightforward. So uh, again, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about them, although they are, uh, they're, they're definitely important for, uh, say, if you're tumbling, it's, it's much easier to handle. And if you need to make uh, rapid changes in, in orientation, they generally can provide very high torque. Right? Here's just a couple examples. Um, uh, other than the, the space shuttle, this is the uh, mobile mobility unit, uh, the thing that's attached to spacesuits. And where are the thrusters here? <laughs> I mean, I, I put this picture here, where's the thrusters? These tiny little things are the thrusters. Here they are. Very small thrusters, because you don't want to create a lot of thrust, right? Uh, especially on the MMU, which is not terribly heavy, so you create a very small amount of thrust. It creates, uh, it gets you spinning, and then you want to stop. So it has a, another pair down here, which will stop you. But they're not in the picture. Uh, and they, there's some over here as well. Uh, this is also an, access, uh, an example of an attitude control, this cold gas uh, attitude thruster. Right, you see small nozzles, right? Um, and uh, there would be pairs of these, right? This is actually close to the, what you've got on the space shuttle, right? So you can create a, a torque in any, about any axis, right? X, Y, or Z plane. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, you're not going to get into the mathematics too much, uh, just to say that, uh, again, right, they create torques about a particular plane, or a, a particular axis, I should say. And uh, while we typically have, like in the previous illustration, like ability to create torques about three axis, really you only need uh, two axes to, uh, to create any desired rotation just by using a 313 rotation. For um, uh, for the case where you have two thrust two pairs of thrusters. Now this isn't true for in general, right? You need torque about uh, about two axes in order to get to 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 achieve any desired orientation. For continuous control, you generally want three axes or four axes. And you know, this is just a standard 313 rotation to achieve any desired axis, right? You rotate about the one axis, right? Uh, this other axis changes, you rotate about that axis. This axis is now changed, and now you rotate about this modified axis to get us into our desired orientation. Right? Again, right, these, uh, these rotate, 313 rotations can generally be inefficient, and so really most spacecraft have three set pairs of thrusters for orientation. Um, when we talk about the Euler's equations and rotation, thrusters are the easiest to deal with uh, because uh, you can create these torques directly and you don't have to worry about counter rotations and counter torques and things like that. Um, the math is easiest for thrusters. But again, because it's easy, we're not going to spend a great deal of time on it. Right. Much more common <clears throat> or much more useful for on-orbit maintenance. That's like continuous control, maintaining that three-axis stabilization over at all times. Our reaction wheels. Uh, reaction Momentum exchange devices, I see is the general term. Uh, this includes CMGs. 
which we'll talk about next. Now, when we went through the mission, various missions uh, in the previous mini lecture, uh, we, we re mentioned, mentioned reaction wheels many times. Uh, we didn't mention CMGs as much. Uh, reaction wheels are very commonly used. Uh, so how do they work? Right? Uh, so basically, momentum exchange device, right? That, that sounds intuitive. Uh, so how does that, what, what's the exchange? How is momentum being exchanged? So basically, you've got a spacecraft here, right? And these, uh, this, uh, this device here, which is this is a reaction wheel, right, is mounted to the spacecraft, right? And so you've got a little motor here, right? And that motor creates a torque. It uses electricity. To create its electric motor creates a, uh, a torque, right? And it creates a torque on this flywheel, right? So it creates a torque on the flywheel uh, that spins the flywheel, right? So it creates torque on the flywheel. It spins the, the flywheel in this direction. Now, Newton's uh, law of, uh, of conservation of momentum, uh, equal and opposite reactions, so both laws, uh, tell you that if you're creating a torque on this flywheel, right, that creates an opposite, equal and opposite torque, a reaction torque on the casing. On the casing. However, the casing is rigidly attached to the spacecraft, and so that torque is transferred through the casing to the spacecraft itself. And you see these structures here, right, that mount this, uh, this, this casing very rigidly, and then the casing is mounted very rigidly to, to the spacecraft. So this electric motor creates a torque on the, on the flywheel in this direction, creates a reaction torque on the spacecraft in the opposite direction. And so that gets the, the spacecraft moving. And then when you want it to stop moving, you create a, a, an opposite torque, which spin slows down the, the flywheel. <clears throat> so uh, essentially what you've got right here is you've got these three flywheels here. And, they, and remember this creates a torque about a single axis, right? So it creates a, t a single axis. So if you've got one mounted on the X axis, uh, the y-axis and the z-axis, right? This one will create can be used to create a torque about the spacecraft x-axis. Uh, these are body fixed axes, of course. We'll talk about that more later. Right? They're not inertial axes, so that that complicates the situation very very slightly. But anyway, it creates a, a torque about this, uh, the body fixed axes. Of course, if you want torque about all three axes, you have to have three flywheels, right? So one to create torque about the x-axis, one to create torque about the y-axis, and one to create torque about the z-axis. Right? So these typically come in groups of at least three and typically four, right? Well, a fourth Y for redundancy and for some other reasons, right? Because Often these reaction wheels fail, which we'll mention in just a second. So these work by conservation of momentum, right? That uh, the, if, if your initial momentum of the, of the spacecraft is zero, right? Uh, then if you apply some momentum to the, to, the, to the flywheel, so this is H flywheel, momentum of the flywheel, right? So the uh, momentum of the flywheel equals negative of the momentum to the spacecraft, right? And so what, this, what does the spacecraft momentum look like? Well, it's uh, the uh, inertia tensor of the spacecraft uh, times the rotation rate of the spacecraft. Plus, of course, don't forget, now the momentum wheel is part of the spacecraft, so we have to calculate that in as well, I x of the flywheel. So that's uh, the entire spacecraft, and this bit is just the flywheel. Right, so uh, if we uh, if we add these in together, right? Um, so the uh, move that up there equals i x of omega spacecraft plus the omega flywheel. Right. 
So uh, we set these, uh, so we move that over there. Just drop it off from over here, right? And so we, uh, we get this equation, this momentum balance here. So if, this, uh, if uh, we have a desired omega s, right, then we can, uh, we can solve for the momentum of the flywheel but just by uh, grouping our terms, um, omega s i x plus j x uh, equals negative i x omega f. Right, and then we just divide by i x to get the omega of the flywheel is omega oops, omega s desired. That's desired i x plus I, j x divided by i x. So we give the uh, uh, the flywheel a particular uh, angular velocity, and that achieves our desired angular velocity of the spacecraft. Uh, so here's just a, a, a visual illustration of that, right? It's relatively simple, right? We uh, create some rotation about one axis, then two axis, then three axes, right? Uh, I can repeat that. Rotation about x, rotation about y, rotation about x again. Or uh, maybe that was a zy. Anyway, something like that. Right, uh, so again, right, this is like what I had on the previous slide, so I don't need to talk about it again. Right, so for a given desired uh, angular velocity, uh, we can achieve that desired angular velocity by spinning the uh, reaction wheel at that reaction wheel, angular velocity. Uh, so again, right, we typically use these uh, sort of continuously to compensate for torques, right? So here's a, a, a robot arm. It has, uh, it, it, it needs to be able to create force on the end effector. So it creates, a, there's a force, let's say, by manipulating something or something like that. And that's going to create a torque on the spacecraft which is then countered by the reaction wheel in real time, continuously, so that, that you, can create, you can manipulate things uh, with your robot arm. Um, so this is, uh, you know, these, are, are, are these flywheels, these reaction wheels, are often, very often used on photography applications. and also communications when high accuracy is uh, required, like laser communications. All right, so photography and high accuracy communications. Um, so they work very well. There are downsides, however. Right? And the primary downside is if you keep doing this, right, then momentum will accumulate in the flywheel. So you keep, get, keep generating torques and generating torques and generating torques, and these things spins faster and faster and faster and faster until, um, until they, they explode. So exploding flywheels is a primary cause of death in spacecraft. Primary failure mode. Right. Um, not just explosions, it doesn't have to be that dramatic. Uh, because typically these things are, are built, uh, so if I go back to the previous slide, right, you can see they're, they're built fairly robustly, right, robust. And you can see there's the, the mass is here at the outer part, 
uh, and it has a very strong structural component. But as with any structural component, right, fatigue can set in. And if that fatigue, if you get a fatigue crack, and this is spinning uh, even at a, uh, within its design tolerance, uh, that the thing can fail. And if this severs, right, then, right, then uh, your, your reaction mass uh, shoots off and blows out the side and destroys your spacecraft. Right. right so uh, dangerous to some extent in that way, uh, especially for big flywheels. So these, 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 these things do explode. Uh, they also not just explode, but even within the design tolerance, uh, the bearings often fail. So again, if we go back to this uh, uh, this image here, right, you see that these are uh, these are spinning about this axis, and there are bearings here, right, along very highly spherical uh, ball bearings. which allow this to spin with almost no friction, right? However, over time, right, if you stress these things too much, the ball bearings can get deformed. Bergs and bearings. Uh, they can get deformed. Or if they weren't perfectly spherical to begin with, they can, uh, they can, they can erode. And if that happens, you get friction. You get friction, and so the, uh, the, the, the flywheel will experience random tor counter torques as you go by um, these deformed ball bearings, right? And, uh, and that happens, again, that's a primary mode of failure. Right? So, it, for example, uh, Kepler, the Kepler Space Telescope, uh, two of the reaction wheels failed. Uh, two failures. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, lost, I believe, uh, at least two or three reaction wheels. Uh, the, uh, the International Space Station doesn't use reaction wheels. It uses CMGs. Those also failed uh, two or three times. But we're not going to talk about them because we're not talking about CMGs quite yet. Uh, in the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, repairs were possible because it was in Earth orbit. Uh, the Kepler uh, was not repairable because it's not anywhere near Earth orbit. We couldn't, we couldn't go there and fix it. So in that case, it led to the death of the spacecraft. So uh, you try to limit your uh, use of reaction wheels to cases where uh, the spacecraft can be repaired or the case uh, where um, uh, the spacecraft is expendable. Um, inevitably, even if the, the, the spacecraft doesn't fail, uh, there are tolerances for how fast you can spin that flywheel. And at some point, you'll need to, to dump this momentum you'll need to spin down your reaction wheel so that you can continue to apply force. And there's a, a few ways to do that for D-spin, right? Uh, you can use thrusters to uh, generate large amounts of torque and then counter it with the reaction wheel to de-spin them. You can use uh, atmospheric drag to create torques on your spacecraft to, de to dump the momentum over time. Uh, and you can use magnetic torquers, which we'll talk about shortly, to, uh, to create counter torques over time and de-spin. Uh, so you got to despin. Uh, that's a downside. Uh, you got you have failures, which is another downside uh, to reaction wheels. But other than that, they're very accurate. 
and they can be used relative to create relatively large torques. So, and that implies, of course, that they can rotate the spacecraft quickly. The second main, uh, uh, so the main alternative to reaction wheels are the uh, control moment gyros. Right. This is the alternative to, tor to reaction wheels. So these are used, for example, on the International Space Station. Um, so the control moment gyros are have advantages and disadvantages, right? To compare to reaction wheels. Uh, so let's before we talk about that, let's talk about the um, how they work. Right? So unlike so they 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 also have a flywheel, just like the reaction wheels. Right. But unlike the reaction wheels, this flywheel is spinning at a fixed velocity. Fixed angular velocity. Right. So obviously, if they're spinning at a fixed angular velocity, you don't create torque by spinning them up and down. So then how do you create torque? Right. Well, you create torque. Well, you don't really try and create torque here. Um, the idea is, well, you, you are creating torque, but really it's a momentum exchange device. And let's focus on that, right? So basically, if you, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a top. It's spinning at a particular angular velocity. And uh, as all spinning things do, it, they're it's sort of spin stabilized. Uh, if you try and rotate it, if you add, if you apply a torque about that axis, right? If you try, try and change the orientation of the spin, right? If you try and change the uh, this, it has an angular momentum vector. If you try and change that angular momentum vector, right? Well, it try, it resists that change. Oops, now I'm off the page. Nope, still off the page, right? So it it try it resists that uh, that that change in, in 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 angular momentum vector, that orientation. Uh, so you use that, right? You create you try you torque the the spacecraft a little bit that way. And what happens when you torque it about right this axis, right? Uh, well, when you torque about that axis, essentially uh, you're adding angular momentum about that axis. And so your angular momentum vector shifts slightly in that direction. So it gets some, some, some component about this axis. So HX, right? So it adds a little angular momentum component in that direction. And so this angle shifts in that direction. So if you're, so the, the, the key is that you torque around this axis and the angular momentum vector rotates a little bit in that direction. So what this means is that with a singular singular control moment gyro, you can torque it about that, that axis, right? About that axis. And you can torque it about that axis, right? So it creates a lever, if you will, so sort of like something fixed, a bar, which you can torque against. Right, some some fixed thing which you can push against, right? So the advantage, one of the advantages of a control moment gyro then is that a single control moment gyro, and the, this is actually what we call single gimbal, uh, single gimbal control moment gyro. Right, this is a single gimbal control moment gyro. Uh, can achieve torque about two axes, 
Um, right. So the magnitude of this angular momentum will be fixed, but its angle will change when you do these torques. And so the downside of this, of course, if you torque it too much, right? This so you say you create a lot of torque about this axis. Let's get rid of this one. Uh, that what's going to happen is this angular momentum vector is going to rotate. And at some point, it's going to rotate all the way down to this direction. And then once it's about that, once it's down here, right, torquing about, you can't, you can't add any more torque around that axis, right? That's gimbal lock. So eventually, right, your momentum, angular momentum vector will align about the thing you're torquing against, and then you've run out of torque, right? That's, that's, that's the downside, that there isn't infinite torque. These saturate. Right. Uh, I mean, the, the reaction wheels sa eventually saturate too, uh, because you reach the limit of how fast you can spin the, the thing, but it not they don't saturate necessarily, right? I mean, it's not quite the same. Right? So here's a, an illustration of a single gimbal control moment gyro, right? And so here we've got a spacecraft. We spin up the control moment gyro. It has some angular velocity vector. And now we can create some torque, right, about one of those axes. And if we kept going, look, we've gone all the way, and now we can't create any more torque about that axis. And so we just have to, to rotate it back, counter torque, and then that causes the spacecraft to stop rotating. So in that way, it's relatively good in that you can control orientation if you're spinning fast enough, but uh, it limits the amount of torque you can accumulate, accumulatively add over time. So the pluses and minuses. That's a single axis control moment gyro. Um, so it's more common to actually have a dual gimbal control moment gyros so that you can create torque about all three axes, right? So, okay, how does that work, right, then? So here's our, here's our, 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 our control moment gyro. Here's a flywheel. Right. In this, uh, in this picture, right, we can, uh, so obviously we can create torque, right, about that axis. Torque, that axis. Pick a new color. Right. Uh, so we can create torque about that axis. We can create torque about uh, this axis. Like that. Um, and so if you create torque around that axis, right, that will, um, that will uh, rotate. Well, actually that's, that doesn't work. Um, so, uh, wait, hold on, what, what am I doing? Um, oh, sorry, yeah, okay, my bad. Erase that. Da, da, da. Uh, we create torque about this axis right there. And that rotates, um, uh, we uh, so we uh, spin the, move the CNG that way, um, and so uh, if we create torque around that one, that'll rotate the thing that way. Uh, so here, actually, getting this all wrong. My apologies. Uh, so that would be create torque around that axis. Right there. So when you create torque around that axis, it uh, rotates the gyroscope that way or this way. Uh, which has a, a reaction wheel to it. Right. So that's a that's a, a dual gimbal control moment gyro uh, used for creating two, uh, two, two axes of rotation. Now in theory, right, uh, you really only need torque about two axes in order to uh, control a spacecraft, right? Because you can use Euler angles, 313 rotations, uh, to achieve any desired uh, angular uh, velocity vector or angular um, orientation for three one three rotations. Um, in practice, of course, these uh, these uh, um, 
CMGs are never used in isolation because you can only get these two axes. And so you, you generally combine them in sets. Um, so here, for example, we have the, uh, uh, the uh, um, a set of four CMGs. This is the most common orientation. Uh, and when you, say, create a torque around that, it rotates the, uh, the flywheels down that way, right? Eventually they saturate and you can't create any more torque, um, except now uh, because they're in the four, so if it was a single CMG, you'd, you'd saturate at that point, uh, at some point, but um, uh, because, uh, um, ah, sorry, I'm getting this all wrong. Uh, but because there's four of them, right, uh, they can continue to rotate uh, rotate on down. So they're, they're, they're grouped in four so you can create torques, uh, a, a net torque about any, uh, any desired axis. This is not actually not a good illustration. Um, so let's see. So here we go. Uh, we can create a rotation about uh, 313 rotations. The, the mathematics here, right, uh, here's our, uh, our, our angular momentum of the flywheel, right? Um, before the rotation, right, uh, the, uh, so the angular momentum of the CMG, uh, the final position of the CMG is given as thus. Uh, so after you've rotated it three times and uh, conservation of angular momentum, the momentum before the rotation and the momentum after should be equal. So we set those two equal to each other. And so uh, for any desired uh, angular momentum vector, right, we can invert this as uh, to, to give our desired rotations. Uh, is just I minus R3, R1, R3, uh, H momentum. Uh, so uh, we just, uh, we solve that. And then, um, uh, and then, then, then we're good, right? So we, uh, we just do this three with throw rotation, apply it to the uh, flywheel. And this gives us our uh, angular momentum vector after. Now, uh, the real question then, of course, uh, can we achieve any desired uh, angular momentum vector through a choice of these three rotations? Find theta one, theta two, theta three. Is this solvable? Right. Uh, can we, you know, basically, can we invert this problem? Right. And uh, the answer is uh, sort of. Um, right. And so we see that question, right? Can we invert? Right. Can we find? theta one, theta two, theta three. Well, it turns out the map between, uh, the, from, from desired angular momentum vector to theta one, theta two, theta three is not perfectly invert invertible. So this is the, this is the uh, momentum envelope for the, uh, that, that four ax, four CMG array here, right? And what we see in particular are there, well, generally there are, this is the uh, HD, achievable HDs. Um, we see that most of these HDs we can get to, there are holes in the, in the, in the, in the map. Holes in the map. Right? So as long as we avoid the holes and don't navigate through one, uh, the answer is true. So we can avoid the singularities. However, if we don't, uh, then we, we have a problem. We get stuck in gimbal lock. And that's what we'll talk about in a second. Uh, before that, uh, however, I just want to go through the math slightly uh, for the, uh, uh, the, the angular, the, for, the, for the CMG. 
Uh, so here's the uh, angular velocity of the spacecraft. Uh, this is the angular momentum of the spacecraft, right? Total angular momentum of the spacecraft. Uh, uh, this is the uh, this is the CMG, right? Um, oh, actually, sorry, no, this is the CMG. This is the spacecraft, right? Um, so this is the inertia tensor of the spacecraft. Right? Uh, so if you differentiate that d d t, uh, then you get this, right? To differentiate that in time, and well, this is obvious where this comes from. Not so obvious where this comes from. Um, uh, that comes from because when you differentiate in the body fixed coordinate system, which is rotating uh, in body fixed coordinate system, which is rotating, you have to add this term in, right? So there's, it's a little bit complicated by that. Okay. And then uh, if uh, then that generates, uh, to, that's the, the effect of, that creates an external torque. So to create this, uh, to, to balance the, uh, uh, the equation, right? We have an internal um, torque, right? That's the internal torque applied to the CMG. So if we apply that to the CMG, we get the, uh, the change in angular momentum vector here. And then balancing that out. So if we, uh, we apply it, um, where is that formula? Yeah, if we plug this formula into here, right? And uh, we get this term right here. Uh, and then we have the, these terms here, these two terms, this adds in right here, right? And so then the U's cancel out and we, uh, and we, get, we get back to this equation up here. Right. So uh, if we see that uh, J omega dot plus H dot, right, goes there, plus omega cross, oops, cross, Omega cross J omega plus H, right? That's equal to J omega dot plus omega cross J omega uh, plus. Now we got H dot uh, plus omega cross H, and then we add uh, uh, plus U minus U equals T X D. And then we just, uh, we, we, if we, we make this equal to zero, right? So we, uh, we, we take, isolate this term here, right? Make that equal to zero. And uh, then we get this, this term here for the leftover bits. Right. So um, basically, right? Uh, this is the internal torque required uh, to create uh, the desired external, or balance the desired external torque, or to achieve these dynamics, if there's no external torque, right? Uh, the limitations of the CMG, of course, are uh, primarily gimbal lock. Um, the uh, so it's what, what I talked about with these singularities. Basically, if you get in, if you get into one of those singularities, this is the situation you're in. You've wrote, you've saturated the torque essentially. You've uh, you've rotated this flywheel. You've added so much torque around here that the flywheel, or actually about here, that the flywheel has rotated up, and it now aligns uh, the flywheel axis with a torquing axis, right? So that you can no longer create torque about this axis. And why is that? Well, you create torque around this axis. It rotates this thing here, uh, which is rigidly connected to this thing. And so that rotates this thing. And, uh, and of course, there's nothing to react against, right? This angular momentum vector is, is constant. And so the only thing you would be doing is just spinning this, uh, this, this wheel. This is free, right? So it would just spin, this, spin the whole gimbal around and do nothing, right? So uh, this is a problem. 
right? So this is a, this is a problem with gimbal lock, and basically you just avoid it, right? Uh, solution: don't add too much torque. Now, when you're rotate doing those rotations, those Euler rotations, you don't really keep track of how much torque you're adding. So you just have to avoid the singularities in rotation. And this is a this is a problem. It's a very complicated mathematical problem. And uh, there's lots of uh, literature on attitude control systems designed to avoid those singularities and in, when you're navigating your spacecraft around, right? So basically, you'll have to choose a, a path of orientation which avoids those singularities, right? It's not a matter of just how much you're rotating your spacecraft. It's a matter of uh, avoiding the singularities in the process, right? It's not where you want to get to, it's the path you've taken to get there. Yeah. Uh, here's just a, a, a little video on um, gimbal lock. And we could just allows us to visualize the, the gimbal lock situations that you can get into when you're moving around. Uh, so these are the, the six, six cases of gimbal lock, right? So let's say, go just pause it for a second. Go back, go back. All right, and you see what's going on here, right? Is that, uh, so this is the, uh, this is the H, right? Oh, there we pause that. Right, that's the H, and now uh, the, your, your, your axes uh, are lined up so that you can no longer uh, torque about that, uh, that particular axis. Right? Um, that middle axis. All right. Okay, so that's uh, CMGs. And despite the fact that they have these problems associated with them, uh, they're very commonly used. Uh, the, the best known case is probably the, uh, the International Space Station. Um, like most like reaction wheels, uh, they tend to be, you tend to want to put them like right at sort of the structural center of the spacecraft. Uh, so they tend, tend to be internal, so you don't, it's really hard to see where they are. Uh, so I believe that the, they were in the Z1 truss, so they were one of the first things added to the spacecraft, but it's relatively invisible here. I'm not sure you can really see it. Uh, they're rigidly mounted the spacecraft, and I'm not sure you can see it. Let's see if, uh, if the, well, here, here you can see they're structurally very solidly attached to the, uh, to the strut, truss because they're creating all these reaction torques, which have to be distributed throughout the spacecraft structure. Uh, there's a four CMG ar array. Um, here's the inner gimbal, right? Uh, the protective cover, right? And you create torques around, you, you torque this thing here uh, you can also torque this inner torquer, right? Uh, and then your uh, your flywheel here is uh, so you can you rotate that'll rotate around like that. Uh, this will let's see uh, rotate within that sphere, right? So this, this rotates that way. This rotates within that loop, uh, and then you've got the the actual flywheel here uh, is, is somewhat hidden. You can't really see it. So the actual flywheel sort of oriented like that. So the shape doesn't actually reflect necessarily the orientation of the flywheel. Uh, let's see, the uh, Z1 truss, that's a Z1 truss on the International Space Station. Uh, the International Space Station uh, Z1 truss as indicated by the one uh, it was activated relatively early, 
uh, because of course you need attitude control for spacecraft, right? So one of the first things added. Um, before that time, the they were using thrusters, but of course that uh, doesn't work very well. So you want to re uh, replace those very quickly. Uh, like most reaction wheels, however, uh, they have problems. And the first problem occurred in June, 2002. Uh, the first CMG one failed. It was replaced three years later uh, I think that was because the space shuttle was no longer active. It took three years to replace it in any case. Um, the, uh, there was another failure in 2006. The CMG3 failed. Uh, it was unclear exactly why it failed. Uh, possibly a sensor. Um, possibly, uh, remember these things have to be desaturated eventually because they get, you know, they get near gimbal lock. Um, so... They were using the atmospheric drag, I think, to desaturate. Or maybe they were using torque. Probably torque because that caused, that's more rapid desaturation. It would cause, more likely to cause failure uh, from thrusters, maybe. In any case, it seems like a bearing failed, maybe, uh, or at least a sensor on the bearing failed uh, during one of those desaturations. And then this other CMG also had to be replaced, and that was done uh, just a year later in 2007. And there's a, you can see the size of these things. Um, there's a, 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 an astronaut moving one around. Uh, he's the, there's no, there's no MMU. He's attached uh, through the uh, robot arm here, I think. So he attaches the thing to the robot arm. The robot arm moves it. He doesn't really. He's unpackaging it here. It's all wrapped up. Uh, here's uh, again robot arm moving the spacecraft, the the astronaut and the uh, and the CMG. Uh, putting it into the Z1 truss. So that's uh, that's CMGs. Um, those are the two perhaps most uh, most uh, common yet most complicated uh, sources of attitude control. Uh, and from there we move on to some relatively simpler mechanisms for attitude control, which don't require quite as much explanation. Um, and the first of those is gravity gradient stabilization. So gravity gradient stabilization is relatively straightforward. Um, basically. Uh, if you put a long pole in orbit, say put a weight on this end or this end, right? Uh, there is some minor variation in gravity because the force due to gravity varies as one over r squared. And this is r, uh, one over r squared. And this is one over r plus delta r squared, right? And this is delta r. So the length of the of the arm is delta r, and so this is well, this force will be smaller than this force, right? And so if this force is larger than this force, right? Even though it's symmetric about the center of mass, right? Uh, this moment arm will be the same as this moment arm, right? Because this force is slightly larger, the sum of the torques, force, uh, one delta x minus force two delta x is greater than zero, that torque, torque net. Okay. So uh, force g1, g2, right? Actually, I think in the picture it's backwards, two, g, two, let's change that to one. So there's some net torque uh, due to the, the weaker force due to gravity up here uh, than down here, right? This is higher force, this is lower force. And so there's some net torque and that will always uh, torque towards uh, the, uh, the, the line from the sea, center of mass to the center of mass of the earth, right? And so it tends to stabilize about that. Uh, about that line. Now there's uh, obviously there's uh, some issues with uh, you know damping, right? It would tend to oscillate that. 
Uh, but there's ways to get around that as well, as I'll talk about in just a second. So can't. So a downside is this of this is it can oscillate. Right. There's no damping in space, and so that's that's a bit of an issue. So there's a passive stability uh, criterion. No electricity is required. No uh, delta V. That's the advantage. Uh, no electricity. Right. So it's cheap. It's relatively easy. Uh, you can use these uh, these counter torquers to create a little bit of damping. Um, it, it, so that is possible. Um, the, there are several well, uh, well well known examples of this. Um, so I, I gave an, an example. The, the Soviets were very good at it. Uh, Australia was one. Those uh, military communications sat satellites. Uh, another example is the uh, Soviet space station Salyut, uh, which was uh, which because it's long, right? Uh, it has a, a relatively large delta R. And so it uh, has a relatively high, the longer you are, the, the greater the gravity gradient stabilization. And because, right, there's no, I mean, as you rotate about the Earth, right, well, you tend to get into a specific, like, rotation rate omega of the Earth as you rotate about the Earth, right? But there's nothing to perturb this. So once you get in a sort of a gravity gradient stabilized attitude, you tend to stay there, right? So stabilize about omega e. Stab stabilizes the angular velocity about omega e. Which is the ro sort of the, the purity of the orbit. Uh, which is 2 pi over the period of the orbit. Right. So, uh, you know, again, a well-known example of this. Um, some more interesting uh, sort of extreme cases of uh, gravity gradient stabilization are space tethers. Uh, so I mentioned space tethers for a brief period of time. Uh, so for example, uh, here, here's a case where you just put a mass on a ball, you put a tether out, and that uh, provides pretty good uh, gravity gradient stabilization. Right? Uh, the extreme cases of these are uh, where you have very long tethers. Right? Uh, so uh, tethering in spacecraft has a relatively long and not very illustrious history. Um, they usually fail. Uh, there, there's various reasons that they failed uh, over the years, right? I won't get, get into all of them, right? Um, so basically, there's several reasons to create tethers, right? So you, you drop a tether down, uh, one of which is the electromagnetic field of the Earth, right? can be used to generate electricity with a tether, right? So as you pass through these EM fields, as the EM fields shift, you generate electricity. So you generate some current, I. So if you have a long tether, you can generate electricity by passing through the EM field slides of the Earth. Unfortunately, there's like, uh, you know, when you get a, get, the tethers that we're talking about are kilometers in length, right? A four kilometer tether, for example, 10 kilometer tether, right? Um, and when you get that long, well, very small, you know, structural failures in the tether can become important. Uh, you can, you can tangle. So structure failure, you can tangle. Uh, sometimes those currents can generate heat, uh, EM heating, which can cause failure. Um, and so most of the tethering uh, experiments which have been launched have failed. Uh, so TSSR got out to 19.7 kilometer long tether. Uh, remember, like uh, now, the space elevator that we were talking about earlier, right? Space elevator, where you go there, is essentially a very long tether, right? You've got, uh, you've got uh, this pointed geosync, and then you've got a tether going down that way, and a tether going out. Oops. Hmm. Sorry about that. Hmm. Oh, too far. 
you got a uh, maybe I shouldn't be writing up here. Um, let's see, where should I be writing? Let's uh, erase this bit here. So uh, the extreme example being the space elevator, you got uh, an anchor and geosync. You have a tether going out that way. You have a tether going down this way. Uh, the uh, centripetal acceleration of that tether counters the uh, gravitational acceleration of that tether, right? And so they sort of balance out and you can sort of un slowly expand these things out. But of course, remember the goal is 100,000 kilometers, right? Which is a very long tether, right? And uh, the, again, we haven't had one that's uh, even 20 kilometers long. Uh, the, the longest that we've successfully had, I believe, is four kilometers, and that lasted 10 years, so that's not bad. Here, these are, this is actual illustration of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of, the uh, of a tethering satellite. Uh, this one, uh, when it got out to 19 kilometers, the gravity gradient force uh, was producing 15 pounds of force, which is a huge amount of force in space, right? The gravity, difference in gravity uh, between 19.7 kilo, uh, produced by 19.7 kilometers uh, distance was 15 pounds. So that's a, that's a great deal of force, right? Uh, the final uh, example of uh, uh, mechanisms for creating torque in space uh, are uh, the magnetic torquers. The, uh, these, are, these are essentially compasses, right? If you think about a compass, what is a compass doing, right? Why is it moving when you move around on the Earth? Well, essentially, the Earth is a big magnet, right? This is the Earth. It has magnetic field lines, right, which, are, which it generates. Uh, you know, those magnetic field lines get bent by the uh, solar wind and so forth, but let's ignore that bit. And uh, you've got a, uh, essentially a, another magnet right there, right? And uh, what happens, right, is that the uh, south pole of that magnet and the north pole of that magnet tend to align, right, with the, um, uh, the field lines created by the, uh, the, the, by the Earth, right? Uh, so and if they get out of line like that, right, then there's some torque, right, created by the uh, cross product of the, uh, the magnetic dipole of that, uh, that compass and the field lines of the Earth. Right. So, the idea basically is that if you built a spacecraft and you attached a compass to it, like a really big one with a big you know, magnet attached to it, uh, the orientation of the spacecraft will follow the magnetic field lines. Well, obviously it's not gonna crash into the South Pole, but you know, as you go past this moment, right, you get some more field lines and it will tend to orientate with those field lines as well. So now, I mean, the goal here is not really to create a, um, a comp uh, create a big magnet on your spacecraft because then you're, you're, you would always be aligning with the magnetic field lines. You don't really want your spacecraft to point this way here and in this way here. So then what do you do? Right. Um, well, we don't actually have a fixed magnet on these spacecraft. They're heavy and, and all that. We have artificial magnets, right? We create uh, coils, coils, right? Um, and we run current through the coils, right? And uh, that current, right, creates field lines, which look like that. And uh, if you coil the field lines together, right, the overall effect of that current is to create a magnetic dipole uh, in the direction of the coil. So if we have two of these, right, right two, uh, two little coils, and we control the amount of current going through each coil, 
we can add those dipoles up to create an artificial, um, let's call it one and maybe dipole two, right? And so the uh, dipole of the spacecraft is the sum of those. And if we had three of them, we could create an arbitrary magnetic dipole on the spacecraft, right? So uh, we have a coil here. Um, now we created an artificial magnetic dipole. This is the dipole that we create. Uh, the, here is the magnetic field vector of the Earth. This is BE. And so the resultant torque is the cross between that dipole and the magnetic field of the Earth, right? So that cross product, right? And so the question is, of course, right, if we, we have total control of that, right, so we can create any magnetic dipole we want in three-dimensional space. The question is, can we create any torque we desire in three-dimensional space, right? Can we invert this equation, right? Can we, uh, given, oops, given a desired torque, torque desired, can we find uh, the dipole which achieves that torque? And the answer is no. Right. And then the other question is why not, right? So it seems like maybe you would be able to. So we've essentially what we've done here is we've written this cross product in matrix form. So you can, you can write cross products in matrix form. Uh, so you write out the elements of this, uh, of this, uh, this vector, uh, put it on the off-diagonal entries. But if we look at this matrix, right, it has zeros on the diagonal. So we can tell right away that there's at least one zero eigenvalue of this matrix, which means it's not invertible. So, I mean, if you think about this, here's the magnetic field line of the Earth, right? Uh, we can create a magnetic dipole uh, in arbitrary direction. And so if you cross the dipole with the field line, right, you get a vector, a torque, which is perpendicular to both vectors, right? So... What that means is essentially is that the torque that we create, no matter what our dipole is, will always be perpendicular to the field line because we can't control the field line. So torque is always perpendicular, perpendicular to the magnetic field line. So what essentially means that means is that we can't, well, we can torque into the field line, we can torque out of the field line, we can't torque around the field line. Right. So we can't create a torque like that. Right. So oops. Probably too much. I can't do that. Can't create torques around. So basically, no roll torques around the field line. We can control pitch, right? We can control the yaw, but we can't control roll, right? So because we don't have three axes of torque, right, we can't use this for three axis stabilization. Um, yeah, so that's the limitation. Right? Uh, so almost always uh, torque rods, so these are the, the dipole creators are called torque rods. Uh, they're almost always combined with other forms of, con of, of control. And in fact, they're actually not u typically used for added active control at all. They're usually used for momentum dumping. for de-spinning those reaction wheels. So they're combined with CMGs or 
um, reaction wheels. Another reason for that is they're very weak, right? Uh, I mean, uh, in theory, right, you can create an arbitrarily strong torque by running an arbitrarily strong current through your torque rod. But, right, uh, if you put too much current through a wire, wires always have resistance. I mean, unless this is a superconducting wire, um, which would be expensive. Wires have resistance. And so you put too much torque through them, they'll melt, right? And so these, uh, these torquer rods that we have uh, are limited. They have the, the, the they're limited uh, to a certain amount of dipole moment, right? And those that dipole moment is typically uh, um, uh, in the range of 10 to 100, right? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on how big the torquer rod is. Uh, so I'll give you an example in a minute. Um, to give it a, to give it a feel uh, for that, I mean, the the magnetic field of the Earth is not terribly strong, right? So that's the magnitude of the magnetic field of the earth, right? And so if we create a, uh, a, a magnetic dipole, arbitrary magnetic dipole uh, of uh, 10 to 100, uh, then we can pretty easily calculate the, mag uh, the achievable magnitude of the torque by just taking the product of those two and then we have the angle between them as well, but uh, that doesn't matter so, quite so much. So if we just run some numbers here, right? So for example, these torque rods are rated at a 100 amp uh, ampere meters squared. Um, if we're up in a 400 kilometer orbit, uh, then, well, actually, the, remember the magnetic field of the Earth declines as you get higher up. Uh, but anyway, at, at 400 kilometers, we, we can use this number. Um, so uh, so we, we plug that in, we multiply it by uh, 100, and we get a net torque of uh, 1.28 times 10 to the negative third Newton meters, right? So emphasis on 10 to the negative three, right? So not a great deal of torque, especially if you're trying to rotate a spacecraft. Now, if you're trying, so if you're trying to rotate a spacecraft quickly, this is not gonna work. However, um, if we integrate this amount of torque over long periods of time, we can create significant amounts of momentum dumping, right? Significant amounts of momentum. If we, if we apply that torque over long periods of time, then we can counter uh, the momentum which is built up in these reaction wheels. change in angular momentum, uh, you integrate torque over time. Right. Uh, so uh, we, we apply torques for long periods of time and uh, generally bleed off the uh, velocity of the flywheel, or in the case of CMGs, we move it away from those singularities. So we reset the CMGs. Um, so that's one application of these magnetic torquers. They're not usually used for active control, right? They're usually combined with a momentum wheel or a CMG, more traditionally a, re a reaction wheel. Um, if you add, really wanted to, oh, sorry, if you really wanted to do three axis stabilization, you could use a reaction wheel for, uh, for roll control, and then you would get three axes. But again, not usually... Uh, advised, and if you have a reaction wheel error anyway, you might as well put four of them and just do three axis stabilization. All right, so again, uh, just going back to uh, uh, these, uh, these websites, we have uh, the reaction wheels right there. Uh, we can see uh, high torque momentum. Right? 
Uh, this one does not seem to have a, uh, I think this one does. So you can see here on these mini spacecraft, here here we even have uh, the case of a uh, uh, of the uh, these magnetic torquers which are built onto the circuit board itself, right? So two axes in this case. Uh, here's a reaction wheel. Let's see we have, what else do we have here. Oh, here's a here's a another a small magnetic torquer. Here's a third magnetic torquer rod if you like. Uh, I don't know what these are rated at. They're relatively cheap. Uh, typically, again, used for momentum dumping in combination with reaction wheels. Right. So now we're almost to the end. Uh, I'll just briefly mention a couple uh, sort of alternatives which don't really have much uh, practical impact at the moment, not really used very much. Uh, solar sail stabilization, right? So you can uh, put a solar sail there bounce uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the solar wind off of it or, or light off of it and create a, a counter reaction to say uh, solar wind bouncing off of a, um, uh, a, 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 a solar panel. Now the actually, I think the best example of actually solar sail for attitude control uh, was if remember that Kepler spacecraft I keep mentioning, right? The one with three reaction wheel, four reaction wheels, two of which failed Right, so this was a, a spacecraft for planet finding, very high attitude control requirements. Uh, it had four reaction wheels, one, two, three, and uh, actually they weren't mounted like that at all. They were mounted like this. Right, so, yeah, now it looks like it's a, a dice, right? Uh, so one, two, three, four, just mounted at the corners there. And then their spin spin angles look like that. Anyway, it lost one uh, due to, uh, to, 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 to uh, basically the bearing, uh, ball bearing failed. Uh, lost another, uh, I believe it was sticking, uh, No, not quite sure the reason. And anyway, so you, in that, now you have only two, uh, torque about two axes. That's not enough for three axis stabilization for detailed planet finding. And so uh, actually what they ended up doing is, uh, is using uh, the solar wind, right, coming in that way, which would, uh, so they oriented the spacecraft in a particular, they, so they chose the orientation of the spacecraft to create a particular uh, torque due to the, uh, uh, to, to the solar wind, torque solar, and that created torque about a third axis. And there was one, two, one, two, three axes stabilization. How well did it work? It worked okay. Um, so this is the, uh, the only, only real example, and it wasn't designed that way, obviously. And it wasn't obviously didn't have a solar sail. They just used the body of the spacecraft for the torque. Finally, um, and then we're not going to talk about it in much depth today because we're going to come back to it uh, in the next lecture in more detail. Uh, the may one of the major mechanisms for attitude control is actually passive, uh, which is spin stabilization. Basically, you spin the spacecraft up, it, it is itself a big momentum wheel, and then uh, it ends, uh, you spin it up about pointing a direct particular direction, and it keeps pointing that direction, uh, even if there are external torques applied. Uh, the disadvantage is you can't use it for three DAW stabilization. So if you think of uh, bullets, right? Uh, why do our rifles more accurate than than muskets? Well, because in a musket you're shooting a ball, right? And mu muskets, by the way, right? They they were they had they 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 spun the musket. Uh, 
But this ball, right, um, it's spinning about an axis, but it's spherical. And so it doesn't matter uh, if it's spinning or not because it, it, can, it, it, can, it can rotate around. Whereas if you have a rifle bullet, right, like that, and it's spinning around its major axis, uh, then it will continue to point in the direction that it was originally fired until it, it hits something. Um, we'll talk about limitations, actually, of that, that sort of rifle analogy uh, for to spacecraft and some failures of the Explorer 1 spacecraft, for example, which tried to do the same thing but failed. Uh, basically because bullets are solid and spacecraft have fuel and other moving parts. Right. Um, so the advantage is it's passive, doesn't require electricity, no active maintenance. Uh, large uh, angular momentum vectors uh, require large torques to change their orientation. So uh, they're relatively uh, efficient. Uh, the downside, of course, is 3 doff stabilization not possible. Once you've spun it in a particular direction, uh, you can't despin it and reorient it. So say you're orbiting the Earth, right? You're spinning about this axis here, right? When you get to the other side of the Earth, you'll still be pointing in the same direction, right? So that's a problem. Um, it's, uh, it's often used for interplanetary, uh, what used to be used more commonly for interplanetary, because that's actually a feature in that case, right? You're, you're pointing towards the Earth, right? So it has a de-spun part, which is always pointing that way, and then the spinning part here, which is, is fixed in attitude, right? So changing attitude after spin up is, is very difficult. Uh, not impossible, but, but, but difficult. Uh, that spin motion, uh, if you, you typically have a despun part, right? And that part is used for communication. But the spinning part, however, uh, is pretty useless, except uh, remember those, uh, those solar panels on the drum. Uh, solar, pa solar power is actually okay. We have good designs for that. But navigation is a problem. And uh, communication requires a despun part of the satellite. So typically, uh, what we've got here is we've got a despun part for communication, uh, which is uh, which can be used for most of the, the spacecraft. So it's despun here. And remember, in uh, in in the early days, right? You'd only really communicate when you're above your ground station, anyway. So if it's pointing towards the ground station when it's overhead. That's all you really need. Uh, some example or an example of a uh, of a spin a spin stabilized spacecraft was the the Pioneer Orbiter. So this was spinning, right? And this part was not spinning, despun. So this would uh, maintain the attitude, right, of the spacecraft overall, while this uh, this uh, despun part could uh, could rotate. Uh, about that axis to point towards the Earth. Uh, you may recognize the orbit, very typical for uh, interplanetary injection. Very elliptic. The minimum delta V for in injection. Uh, inclination, uh, 105 degrees on Earth's, uh, Venus's uh, orbit. Uh, this is actually only a 24-hour period, uh, basically mapping. And the despun part is used for communication, right? Interplanetary uh, spin stabilization for communication uh, used to be a fairly common application. Uh, a couple final words about uh, the Vi uh, Venus Orbiter, Pioneer. Remember, Pioneer was also uh, those inter interstellar space probes we talked about earlier. Um, 1978, so again, talking like 50 years ago. Uh, wait, uh, 42 years ago, right? Uh, arrived, launched in May, arrived in December. Uh, the uh, Tenedish was despun to constantly port towards Earth. Uh, 
Um, it actually survived quite a long time. Uh, at some point, uh, that that app that periaps was raised to 2,300 kilometers. So that's that was fine. It finally uh, ran out of fuel, re-entered on uh, October 22nd. Uh, in the mid in the meantime, uh, in 1992, uh, there was actually another. In the meantime, uh, a mission to, to Venus, the Magellan spacecraft, uh, at, at which time the, uh, Venus, the, the Pioneer one changed its argument to periaps so that the apoapse occurred over the northern versus the, uh, the southern hemisphere, delta, omega story there. Uh, so a big uh, change of an argument of periaps of uh, 25, 26 degrees. Right, to keep track of Magellan and so forth. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. Oh yes, one final uh, uh, example of spin stabilization, Sputnik, right? We'll talk about why this was, spin stabilization can go wrong in the next lecture. But this is a case where it did go wrong. Uh, in fact, it was originally spin stabilized as many spacecraft are when they're initially launched. Uh, but that spin stabilization actually decayed fairly quickly after about uh, five days. And uh, it was originally spinning at 12 uh, RPMs. And uh, after a few days, it was only spinning at uh, around six or seven RPMs, um, possibly tumbling at them. Uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the reason uh, given, uh, atmosphere. Uh, was was the reason given. Uh, there's another example of spin stabilization going wrong, which we'll talk about next time, which is uh, the Explorer 20 in the Alouette uh, spacecraft. Um, again, spin stabilization is still used uh, between the periods of uh, separation from the lower stage and the upper stage. You sort of, sort of spin your, sta your uh, spacecraft until it's, uh, so it maintains attitude until all its orbit, its functions are ad activated, at which point it despins, and there's various ways for despinning, including yo-yo despin, where you sort of release little cables and they sort of drag the spacecraft out of the spin. Uh, this is despinning, not spinning. Uh, so you release a, stump, uh, a uh, sort of a yo-yo, which goes off, you just like cut the cord at some point, and that uh, uh, eliminates your angular momentum vector to a large extent. Uh, finally, next lecture, we'll talk about the equations of motion, right? So with this lecture, we've talked about how to create torques, how to, and then in the next lecture, we'll create, talk about how, what to do with those torques, how to control your spacecraft in the body, the difference between the body fixed and the inertial axes and how those, uh, the, the equations of motion are quite different. Um, because remember, you're generating torque in the body fixed frame. So torque is in the body fixed frame. And how does that affect motion in the inertial frame? Torque is in the body fixed frame, but motion is in the inertial frame. And it turns out uh, the equations of motion, uh, because of that, become very complicated. But we'll talk about that next time. And, uh...